practice. My first job, I was paid less than $80 a month. Okay. So, which I know if somebody was to hear, a dentist was to hear, hear, hear this, they would be like, oh my God, how is that true? But that's true. I made less than $80 and I am very grateful for that job. No, 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 it's important. And it's so funny because a lot of my colleagues, my really good dear friends from Pakistan, they just send sometimes they give me a call. Mo, you know, my dentist, he is asking me to have scaling done twice a year or something. I'm like, dude, it's important. Please do it. Subscribe to Dental News Channel and also press the bell icon for latest updates. Share and comment on the links. Thank you. Hello and assalamu alaikum. This is Dr. Saad from Dental News and today we have a very special guest for our interview and he is Dr. Muhammad, Dr. Muhammad Ahmed Javed. He is a board certified periodontist and implantologist from Canada. He did his uh, basic BDS degree from Pakistan and then he did his uh, one year fellowship program over here in Pakistan again. And then he moved straight to Canada where he did his two masters and uh, now with the uh, great honor and respect i would like to introduce uh, dr mohammed ahmed javed to you guys so here it goes so dr mohammed ahmed javed how are you doing assalamu alaikum i'm doing good alhamdulillah thank you thank you right, thank sir. you for so, yeah, thank you sir since you're a periodontist so i know it it will be a very you know a cliched conversation but yes let's let's try to make it uh, sound really helpful for the audience as well and uh, i hope you have a great time with us i appreciate it thank you all right sir so the first question would uh, i would like to ask you is sir why uh, the the question the main question why did you choose periodontology so the basic answer is when i was growing up in pakistan i was in dentistry i did my basic dentistry from pakistan like you mentioned FMH College of Medicine and Dentistry Lahore. During that time, all the special specialties were very well established in Pakistan. I think pretty much we had all specialties uh, since 60s, probably 50s, I'm not aware. But by 2000s, all the specialties really nicely well established. Surgery was amazing and uh, so was ortho and all the other specialties. One specialty which was not established and we did not have a single fellowship program in Pakistan and in Pakistan, for those uh, who do not know, in Pakistan, it's different. For example, in US, what we have is diplomat. That's considered the top qualification. That's what you aim for if you're a specialist. In Canada, it is fellowship. And in Pakistan also, it's fellowship. So it's called FCPS. In Pakistan, we did not have FCPS. I think it only started in 2016. And as far as I know, there is only one institute, which, which is my parent institute from Pakistan, which is approved for training of FCPS right now as we speak. So we didn't have a uh, period back home in, in, in that time. And I knew in undergrad studies, I believed, and after my experience limited, whatever it is, even in North America or Canada per se, I think my belief has been reinforced, which is in undergrad studies, we learn about pretty much almost all facets of dentistry. And even if we don't know, if we even if we don't go in great deep depth, we still get a good hang of it, except surgery and orthodontics. We don't get full appreciation we don't get a good idea and we don't do any major surgeries or ortho treatment. So those two fields have always, always, always been really close to my heart. Specifically Perio, because I remember in the final years, you're influenced by your teachers, your mentors, people you really like, appreciate and follow. I like surgery. I also really like aesthetics. And so Perio was considered plastic surgery, and it was considered something really sleek, nice, pretty, awesome. But we did not know what perio was. So it was more of a mystery, which increased its uh, intrigue for me. And I felt that, you know, I really... And then we had an instructor, Dr. Kurama Taula. I think he was one of the very few, very few who had come from uh, Singapore. He did his uh, membership. 
he had done his membership, I think, around that time. Now he's a fellow with Royal College England or Edinburgh. But he had come in and he was that uh, role model, if you will. And we were just following him. And he was the first one who introduced even uh, Kevitron. And like, you know, and I would like to emphasize here, any other specialty, any other specialty in Pakistan, it's top notch. It's the standard is unbelievable. It's amazing. And I cannot like, you know, and I say it after having, I've been lucky, I've been really privileged and lucky and fortunate. And I'm grateful that I've had the honor and opportunity to be involved in three universities in dental, in dentistry in Canada. And I, I take pride in it and I'm grateful and I'm humble. Uh, but I still have to say that, you know, McGill University of Alberta, University of British Columbia, and after seeing their systems, I can say that, you know, dentistry, other specialties in Pakistan, they're really good. But when it comes to perio, we, we were lagging. We were really lagging. And all this increased the intrigue, the curiosity, and I ended up picking up perio actually. And I absolutely enjoyed it. Absolutely love it. All right. So, so since you talked about uh, all things are great over here in Pakistan, but you still have that uh, that question that uh, Perio is still, you know, it's not up to that mark like the other like the other specialities. So, yeah. what do you think is the cause for that? What are your, if I say, if you can sum up in two main basic things? Like, what are the things which are lacking in Pakistan regarding Perio's, uh, you know, I wouldn't say downfall, but uh, it's not there. It's like a single plateau regarding Perio. One, I think it will take time. So if you think about it again, think of it this way. All the other specialties were established in the 50s or 60s. And today when we are talking, it's been 60, 70 years or something like that, close to that, right? So it takes time. Just like nations, just like anything. So it takes time. Perio in full scope, full-fledged Perio was only established in 2016. In fact, I remember Dr. Khurram contacted me and said, Mo, uh, can you like you know, can you give me some input about the program in Canada and all that thing? And so so I know I've uh, although I've not been involved in it directly, but I've seen the Perio program take baby steps and I'm very confident, I'm hopeful over time it will establish into, into a very nice specialty uh, with all the facets of perio being practiced. The other thing is overall I think we need probably, at least in my case, I, I felt when I was in Pakistan I was uh, very impressed by few instructors and I to this day when I'm doing a procedure, just like yesterday, I'll give you an example. I was extracting a tooth and once it was done, I clean everything up, added bone and whatnot. And I was telling my assistant, I said, every time I extract a tooth, it reminds me of my professor of surgery from back home, Dr. Abhidashan. He would always say, Mo, never extract, ease it out. He could do it, like, you know, despite having done many, many extractions and these procedures to this day, and I think I will never be able to do it. He could do it. I've not seen many people who can do it consistently. He just puts the elevator and it, it's as if he's talking to the truth. It's amazing. So we need role models. We need people who are willing to share, who are willing to mentor, guide. And also I think uh, the students as well, if they are willing to absorb, like it has to come together from teachers aspect, from students who are willing to learn, who are humble, who want to improve, want to learn. So I think it's a matter of time and we just, over time, we will have hopefully more and more mentors and things will improve. Perio will will get its due, I think. It's just a matter of time. Right, sir. So I think uh, I'm also very inclined towards uh, periodontics and I think it's Amazing. the same thing as if, as you just said that you need that mentor and that person, you know, who makes you realize how important this, this subject is. And, yeah, and so, those like if I I apologize I'll give you and I I cannot I cannot stress it enough I apologize for like you know I, it's just you reminded me of something I'll give you an example of it of an amazing instructor I am I am grateful I am blessed for having some of the best instructors one instructor and I give this example in my lectures and I 
openly talk about it because that changed me. And I try, try to follow that particular instructor. So I was placing, when I was in Canada in residency, that was my first implant case. And I was supposed to place two implants. The site was 3.6 and 3.7. Now it's a difficult site, especially if you're placing your first implant. So to give you, a lot of people may not know, but the idea is, let's say this is tooth number, let's say this is tooth number 3.5. So what you want to do is you want to follow the parallelism of this tooth. So the ideal implant would be just parallel like this. And my final year resident was assisting me. I did my initial drilling and then I took a radiograph, which is like x-ray. So I took my radiograph and once we saw the radiograph, the implant was actually coming this way, about to hit the root of three, five. Maybe I was two, three millimeters short. As soon as my senior saw the radiograph, he gave me a nasty <laughs> stare and he said, Mo, go and get Dr. Ganad. In my heart, I was thinking, I'm screwed, I'm done. So I go and I say, Dr. Ganad, sir, sir, uh, can you please come? I knew that I have screwed up and this is going to be really bad. He comes in, he takes a look at the radiograph uh, while he's at the door. He says, voila, that is beautiful. That is amazing. Excellent move, well done. Let me have a peek. He comes in over my shoulder, sees the area and he says, Mo, you know what? This is amazing. Now let me show you a trick as to how we can improve it even further. He came in, he corrected everything. He stood there. He, after correcting, he made sure I placed the implant. Then for three, seven, he stood there, practically held my hand, helped me place three, seven as well. When everything was done and over, everybody left the office. I went to the instructor and I said, sir, I'm really sorry. I have never placed an actual implant before. This is my, this was my first case. I apologize. And he looked at me and he said, Mo, don't worry about it, man. You'll be fine. This was my job to help you place the implant safely. You did really, he did not shatter my confidence. He built it up. And I learned so much that day, not just from clinical standpoint, but I also learned how I should be trying to be a better person, better mentor. And I shouldn't be somebody who shuns people away. And that was by far my role model when I practiced perio is Dr. Ganar to this day. All right. Uh, so, sir, you're talking about implants. So, sir, uh, since uh, the conversation is going towards implants, well, but we'll come back to perio again since you touched upon uh, the implants. So, sir, over here in Pakistan, uh, what you see is implant is number one, it's taught in the subject of surgery, oral surgery. So, do you think that's right? And the second question in, uh, in addition to that is, uh, in undergrad, the amount of implant knowledge is, is you know, is not sufficient enough <clears throat> in Pakistan, in the undergrad level. So, do you think that needs to be improved? Or do you think implants is something really, you know, it's a it's a speciality? Or do you think that it, the undergrad syllabus for the implants should improve, or it should stay as like, you know, a basic, just a basic implant topic? Or do you think the undergrads need need to know more about implants? So from what I gathered, I didn't clearly get the first question. Let me repeat, and please let me know if that's what you meant. The first one was that implants are considered the mainstay or a lot of focus is being put on the implant training in the oral surgery programs. And if that's a good thing or a bad thing, that's what I... Yes, so with oral surgery, what we mean with oral surgery is in, in context of Pakistan, we have maxillofacial surgery, oral and maxillofacial surgery. And oral and maxillofacial surgery is, I am a big fan and I cannot say enough nice things about oral and maxillofacial surgery. They are amazing people. And I have utmost respect for them. They, the stuff that they do is amazing, unbelievable. And I've seen some great programs. I have had the privilege to observe basically for two weeks, the oral and maxillofacial program at McGill was amazing. And I take, I don't want to say I take pride, but oral and maxillofacial surgery is really close to my heart. Why? Because when I did my primary fellowship, FCPS in Pakistan, which again, for the people who do not know, 
back in my time, it was super competitive. About 1,000 to 2,000 people appeared in primary fellowship exam and from Nepal, from Saudi, from UAE, from Pakistan, and only 30 people on average would pass out of all the pool. My batch was the first batch in which 62 people passed. I was one of them. After I cleared my FCPS, the primary FCPS, my plan was if I stayed in Pakistan, I, I wanted to do either ortho or surgery. Why? Because we didn't have perio. And surgery or ortho, like I said initially, were the two fields where I felt are the ones where you don't learn much about them during the undergrad. So that was my plan. So oral surgery has a very special close place to my heart. Now, having said that, oral and maxillofacial surgery is a very big field. If I was an oral and maxillofacial surgeon, my, I would think that I would want to be the very best and I would want to be able to deal with trauma and cancer cases. Like I was blown away when I was at McGill. I know maxillofacial oral programs in Pakistan are top notch, second to none. And it's very important and it's very good that you place a lot of emphasis on implant, but there should be no compromise. You should increase the workload if needed, but the attention, for example, paid for cancer surgery, trauma surgery, none of it should be taken away. If more load needs to be placed on implants, good. But implants should not compromise the management of the other aspects. A resident should be able to completely master, not master because in residency, even up in private practice, you don't become a master, but at least they should be competent enough to manage cancer cases. I know a lot of oral surgeons, oral and maxillofacial surgeons, even here, who don't feel comfortable doing cancer surgery. And I understand it depends where you've been trained, but that's where the emphasis should be. And then implants should be like a cherry. They should be they should be really competent and it's not difficult. I think, I think like, you know, yes, I understand all like generally a lot of implant cases are not, uh, they are not difficult compared to head and neck surgery, let's say. Right. So there should not be a compromise on the oral maxillofacial surgery quality training, but implant should be on top of it, like, you know, extra work for that. That was, that's just my two cents. Number two, your question was about the implant knowledge implant skill implant training education at the undergrad level right that's the second question now with regards to that i think when it comes to theory yes we i believe at least the curriculum at my at my time i i think we lack uh, we were not as much abreast with what's going what was going on in the world at least in my time and theory is much better here, number one. Number two thing, implant is very closely related to the prosthetics. So I feel very strongly that the prosthetics side of things related to implant were not that much in our curriculum. So I, I feel that's what's lacking. When it comes to the practical side of things, the reality is even as we speak today, um, undergrad students typically, they don't do implants. That's why all the general dentists, once they graduate, they take either courses or they do specialties because they really, if they want to excel, that's the only way. And I don't know, honestly, I've not been involved in teaching that much. I don't have a very big data to analyze and compare and say, okay, if we were to do this, this would make a huge difference or, or not. But we are not that far behind when it comes to skill set at the undergrad level. Why? Because it's pretty much more or less the same here in North America. When it comes to theory and knowledge, yes, it's better here. With regards to implant and prosthetics of the implants, when we compare undergrad to undergrad. So I think that should improve Pakistan. Right, sir. So since again, we're talking about implants. So, uh, so sir, what a criteria would you establish when you uh, give an implant? Like who is the ideal patient to give implant? Cause over here in Pakistan, there is like a conundrum when we talk about implants. Cause uh, we're seeing that it's either malpractice or it's either a money making tool. So since uh, you've been there, done that, I don't know how many implants you've done, but uh, since you have experience, so what is your basic 
uh, criteria to place implant in a patient? So first off, I'll say I, I, I wouldn't I, like I wouldn't want to be associated with uh, been there, done that because I'm just another Joe. I'm just a, I'm student of perio and implant in, industry. I just want to learn more. And the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know much. I want to I want to excel. I want to improve and learn more. Having said that, whatever little bit I know, I'll share with you and I'll give you like, you know, that it's a big thing. Like, you know, there are a lot of things that you go through checklist, whatever, but to, I'll give you a couple of simple examples to make it simple. During residency, I placed an implant uh, in a patient where there was a probing wise when we measure probing, we peritoneal probing or a had a five or a six millimeter pocket or something. And I remember it became a big deal because it was my mistake. Now, and somebody looking from the outside may say, oh, they made a big deal out of it. No, they were right. My instructors were right. The thing is they wanted to inculcate in me. They wanted to engrave in me the fact that one thing which you should be doing absolutely essentially before even thinking about implant is to ensure that there's periodontal stability. There are no deep pockets. If there are deep pockets, let's say an isolated five or six millimeter pocket, then there is a plan in set in which will take care of that. Or patient is cognizant of that. Patient is willing to take the risk that, you know, it may lead to peri-implantitis, mucositis or implant failure. So, I thought at that time, wow, did I do part of it something really bad? And yes, the idea was they wanted this in me. Now, when, I, when it comes to placement of implants, I look at a lot of things. But this is one thing. Interestingly, my colleagues were, and I, am, I bring it up because I'm grateful to my teachers at UBC. My colleagues, we, I work at a very nice facility. It's a very nice, I work at two private practices, one of which is a specialty practice, very nice practice. And the other one, we have general anesthesia. Even. So it's a very nice, I'm privileged, I'm grateful. And it was so nice that I was sitting amongst all my colleagues and our senior periodontist was saying that uh, she wanted to bring something up. And she said, before I bring it up, I want to say more, you're already practicing it. For the rest of us, we need to make sure that more, she was saying, in every patient, even before he does any implant or anything, he just goes through the checklist, one of which is basically the probing and full mouth exam and whatnot. So if there are, and, and another thing I would say, so this is one thing which I think even in North America, not a lot of people, do. they don't go, they don't do the full mouth charting, which is necessary. Another thing is, which is very interesting, which is related to board exam as well. Back in the day, when I was preparing for my fellowship in American board exam, the question was, is keratinized attack gingiva or keratinized tissue important for implant health? And I remember, like, you know, the answer would typically be, if you look at the literature, for example, Bori 2008, it states that when they compared the implants which had that versus those which did not, the probing depth, the attachment, the uh, recession, the thickness of tissue, the aesthetics, the bleeding on probing, all those things were significantly, uh, not, yes, significantly worse for the implants which did not have keratinized tissue or attached gingiva. But the difference was not very statistically significant. So the answer would be yes, it is important, but clinically, it was statistically significant, but clinically not very different. So that was the answer. But now in my private practice, when I work, and we have seen it now that the importance of the keratinized or attached change of our keratinized tissue, there are different things, but the importance of attached keratinized tissue is there. It's there. So I tell my patients, if I am placing my implant, I would want to make sure that I do the best that I can, that my implant lasts a very long time. And if you think about it, when the implants were introduced in the 1960s, uh, roughly speaking, Brandmark was the guy. When the implants were introduced, it, it's an era of 50, 60. They're still experimenting up until, let's say, 1990s. You wouldn't hear about peri-implantitis or peri-implant mucositis. Why is that the case? Think about it. 
you wouldn't hear much about it and then suddenly in 2000s it just blows in our face like you know perimplantitis mucositis depending on what you read so for example if you read the paper from pools led 2010 i think depending on the definition you use it varies from 5 to 11% but if you read elsewhere lindy european workshop <clears throat> it the number is different 38 to 83% so the question is why is that the case the reason is like you mentioned that when they started placing implants the criteria was so stringent so stringent that it was almost impossible to be enrolled in a program where they would place implants you needed to have regular dental hygiene optimal care non smoking medically fit no diabetes if you had it had to be perfectly maintained all those things what it led to was an environment which in which implant would thrive in today's world when a patient comes in and is missing has a missing tooth that means an implant right implant 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 Another thing I see very often, which is related to this, if a patient has three missing teeth, four missing teeth, four implants, six missing teeth, six implants, <laughs> you know, if there is a space, there is an implant, and I think, wow, wow. So it's a very long answer, but a lot of things, small things, bone, soft tissue, probing, lack of periodontal disease, what is the smoking status, how's the oral hygiene, if those things are not there. then you're planning for a failure somebody says if you're not planning then you're planning for failure so if you're not looking into those things then probably you'll end up with a the bad implant so i would i have had cases i can tell you in private practice where patient was willing to pay a lot of money a lot of money and i very politely very humbly suggested that you know let's try to control the other factors first because otherwise like i don't feel comfortable placing implants if the foundation is not right if the basement is on fire would you want to build a house on top of it that's just my sense so some of the things i don't know if i've answered your uh, question correctly but i would look into these things probing soft tissue bone and all those things and then if needed take the like you know most probably i'll take a ct scan as well cbct which is basically ensure i have measurement do i have 1.5 mm i personally aim so the thing is when you're placing an implant you the literature says you want at least 1.5 mm of bone on the buckle of the implant me personally i try for 2 or 2.5 if possible more bone so all those things what is the occlusal load like and are we taking care of the hygiene is patient committed what is the smoking status all those things all right sir uh, thank you for that uh, sir again you talked about treatment planning so the do you think it is the most essential step in uh, commencing anything like before your skill set your treatment planning should be up to the mark what is your take on that so all things are equally important think about it this way i'll give you two example before you build a house you need the design the architect has to come up with a design then the engineers or people who build the house they actually build the structure same concept treatment plan is what gives you a blueprint to hopefully execute a very nicely placed implant surgery treatment ortho all those things having said that i remember this question actually reminded me i remember uh, i went to my instructor lit review instructor in residency dr hacking and god bless him amazing instructor and i said sir and like you know i would like to acknowledge i would like to take this moment in this question to acknowledge some every residency has like in you know, all the programs have their pros and cons and i am grateful for people and the program at ubc in vancouver one thing which made in my opinion ubc perio very unique i don't know now but at least in my day if somebody asked you a question you would answer the question with a number of references in my batch at least that was the thing and the exam was that in the in the lit review exam we would write a review paper with references that was the exam 
So if somebody was to give you a topic, you would write an actual review paper with all the references. So I remember I went to my instructor and uh, not just the author, the year of publication. So I went to my instructor and I said, Dr. Hakinen, like, you know, we read about diabetes, we read about smoking, we read about bone, all these things, but they are so random. Like it's one day it's diabetes, the other day, why there is no, I feel confused. And he told me, he said, Mo, trust me, by the end of third year or in the third year or somewhere there, you will develop the lateral conditions. I didn't understand. And when I was finishing my program, I went back to him and I said, sir, I just want to thank you today that the thing that you said about a year ago now makes sense. So when you are learning about treatment planning, let's say in a session you're sitting, they're teaching you, you have to consider these things. They form the basic uh, concept of a treatment plan. In the other session you're going, they're talking about flaps and whatever. It appears at that stage, or at least it appeared to me that I was bombarded with information. I couldn't, I look at the Urdu may I couldn't get the sira like you know how, from where do I start? We as humans, even in our school, we like organized things. In graduate level, you feel as if the information is being bombarded, and it takes a while before things. It's as if the pieces of the puzzle come together, and then you can see the final beautiful picture. So, treatment planning is essential. But all the other skills, all the other tools also need to be there. And you build everything together towards a crescendo where, like, you know, things, the picture becomes visible, clear, and you can see and you're like, okay, now it makes sense. But coming back to what you said, treatment plan, absolutely essential. And one more thing, if you allow me, if I may add, not just the plan of what you're about to do. I try I can't claim that I always do it or I'm always been a, I've always been able to do it, but at least I try. This is my plan A. If for some reason it doesn't work, this is my plan B. And if it doesn't work, hopefully have a plan C. And I discuss it with the patient that I cannot guarantee you. Like, you know, I take a lot of pictures in my surgeries and I show sometimes some people like to see, for example, I'll give you an example when I'm doing a connective tissue graft or I'm doing a coronal positioning of the flap. I've done it where pe people would be like, you know, patients are like, wow, at the end of the procedure, when I show them the picture, they're like, wow. And I say, you know, okay, listen, thanks, appreciate. But during healing, healing is one thing which I cannot control. My pictures show that my surgeries hopefully are, are good enough. If, if I'm not the best in the world, I'm far from it. I would want my work to be really good. My surgeries show that, and I take pictures to show it to my patients and other people, but I cannot control healing. I know biological principles and whatnot, but everybody heals differently. So you should have a plan B and a plan C, hopefully, and if things don't work, you discuss it. One of my instructors, God bless her, used to say, explanation prior to the procedure is explanation. Explanation after the procedure is an excuse. So always prepare the patient for A, B, and C plan. Right, sir. So thank you for that, sir. And sir, uh, another question, which is, uh, you know, a part of the, you can say the talk, the dental talk here in Pakistan is that the multidisciplinary approach. Because over here in Pakistan, you see that uh, every uh, you know, every guy, every dentist, he tries or, you know, he does things all on his own or all on her own. So do you think is that something which is, uh, you know, making the bar go down in Pakistan? Because as you said that you're a board certified periodontist and you do your main speciality is periodont periodontics, but you can do those other procedures as well. That operative dentistry, aesthetic dentistry, you can do that too. But since you have the speciality, because uh, in Perio, you would prefer to do that. But over here, uh, there's this, you know, I would, there's this black cloud, you can say that every person wants to do everything on their own. So what's your take on the multidisciplinary approach? So I'll break it down into two parts. 
One is what is my opinion or my take on the multidisciplinary approach. Second is that, you know, we practice paleo specifically here in Canada, let's say, whereas in Pakistan, people are doing everything. So, you know, there are pros and cons of pretty much everything where, where you practice it included in that thing. So I'll give you an example. In Pakistan, so if I think from their perspective, let's say a periodontist working in Pakistan, if I think from their perspective, their problem is the way the private practice is, the way, like, you know, I don't like to say it, but it's a reality that financial side of things are also very critical. They are very important. People have to pay bills, whether anybody, including myself, likes it or not, but that's the harsh reality. So in Pakistan, the problem is when the patient comes in, if you cannot do a root canal, the patient will go away and you don't want that. So you do the root canal, do the end of treatment or Visalign or ortho or perio or whatever, even if you're a specialist. There are a few oral surgeons I know, maxillofacial, who only practice that, but I know a lot of maxillofacial surgeons as well who are doing root canals as well because they want to make sure that, you know, they're paying the bills. And for people who don't understand, it's it it's it comes down to the financial side of things. When I did my house job, and I have no bar in saying saying that, I tell it to people all the time. When I finished my house job, which is the one year GPR residency, what we have here in North America. So when, when I finished that, I went into private practice. My first job, I was paid less than eighty dollars a month. Okay, so which I know if somebody was to hear, a dentist was to hear, hear, hear this, they would be like, oh my God, how is that true? But that's true. I made less than $80 and I'm very grateful for that job. Very grateful. Having said that, so financial side of things is important. And sometimes that's what forces people back home to do stuff. But then that leads to other problems. In Canada, for example, in my case, I cannot practice anything other than perio. I'll give you an example. If I'm a specialist who specializes uh, not just from license perspective, but from real life perspective, I'll give you an example. Let's say, let's say I'm a general dentist, born, raised, did my general dentistry in Canada, and then I became a specialist ortho or a perio, let's say, in Canada. Now, if I do general dentistry, and specialty both, then people would not want to refer because here it's a referral. The specialty practice is a referral based practice. If I'm a general dentist, I will do my own cases. And if I'm a special simultaneous, I'm doing a specialty, I will do the specialty cases. The, the general dentist from the other office would be my competitor as a general dentist. So they wouldn't want to send me the case fearing that the patient, when I do the specialty, the patient may not go back. So the mode of practice here is referral based for the specialist. So that makes it easy. That's the, that's the reality. So I don't blame people in Pakistan. Having said that, the problem is in Pakistan, when you practice everything is you don't get enough of those cases which, uh, which fall in your domain. So if somebody used to ask me like the other day, uh, not the other day, I'll give you an example. Actually, it's a lot of funny, but when I was in residency, in UBC, my mom was visiting me and she needed a simple filling. So I went to the reception and I said, I want to have, can you kindly book my mom for uh, uh, with so-and-so? And they said, okay, mom, we'll do it. What for? I said, simple filling. So the front desk staff, they looked at me and they said, what do you mean? You could not do a simple filling for your mom. I said, one, I'm not allowed, but even if I could, I don't feel comfortable. The last time I did a filling was, I don't know, 2009, 10, 11, somewhere there, 2011, maybe or 10. I have not done any for the last five, six years. I don't feel, I'm, I feel more comfortable placing an implant or doing a gum graft or surgery than doing a simple filling because I've not done one for the last 10 years or something like that, right? So when you don't do enough, then, then you don't, you're not in touch. And another example I'll, I'll give you is, I remember I asked my professor, I was fortunate or unfortunate that I also saw an MI or a heart attack in a dental chair. And the way it was managed was 
टॉप नॉच टॉप नॉच अनबिलीवेबल और ओरल सर्जरी इट वॉज डॉक्टर इम्तियाज अमेजिंग अमेजिंग द पेशेंट हैड एन एम आई and like you know everybody i was in my gpr residency uh, house job basic and we were panicking myself my colleagues everybody i was assisting and uh, i was standing there then the person who dealt with the mi dr imtiaz he asked my class fellow can you take the blood pressure and i remember all the tools are like going in here nobody we were panicking he came in he dealt with it very nicely amazing amazing once it was done i went to the professor and i asked him sir if can i ask you a question if you are not if you don't get upset whatever and he said no no go ahead i said sir let's say if you were there would you be able to or if this thing happens would you be able to manage it as competently as efficiently and all and he gave me a very honest and great answer he said mo i used to run code blues in emergencies all day long and i have done it for 20 years or so and i could do it sleeping now i have not done it for the last 5 10 years if if i had to i could but i don't feel comfortable doing it so if you're not in practice you either use it or you lose it so even if you do like i am a strong believer when we had quarantine when we had quarantine people were not going to practice when i went back i had not done a surgery in 2 months or something like that i i went there and my first day i had three surgeries i think three or two took me 5 minutes not even 5 minutes and i was in the group was very it was just all built in reflex so if, if you have done a lot of those like it's just like driving if you do driving i did not drive in canada for the first i don't know 7 or 8 years but the moment the day i sat in the car boom came back like this so if you've done a lot like let's say you're a specialist in perio in pakistan you've done a lot and you've done well so that you critique yourself i look at my pictures the cases and i critique myself how could i improve if i was to put my suture point 5 mm here there all those things i think about them if you do your practice that way and you're doing endo i'm pretty sure over time you'll be able to do great because i know a lot of general dentists here in canada in north america who do all facets and they do great stuff i know people general dentist who place implants better than me i can say it openly i know general dentist who do perio better than me. like you know so if you do a lot of if you do a lot of volume and you're critical of yourself you want to improve then over time even if you're practicing in pakistan and you're doing a lot of endos over time you can become very good in perio and same goes for the other fields as well right sir thank you for that so sir since you uh, since you're talking about perio again so what is the scope uh, if you talk about canada for perio because there are there will be students who will be listening to us and uh, they will they, they it's again it's in the there they would be in that phase where they know that they have to do something and canada seems to be a very optimum option these days so what is your advice to those students who are you know opting for canada in terms of perio so i'll 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 give the answers i'll give the answer in a way that it will be general initially and then i'll talk specifically perio if if it's okay with you growing up when i was in second year bds and it's especially unfortunately people from north america canada they w- they may not have an appreciation they may not understand but we we come from a third world country a developing country which is pakistan so we have a growing up huge population limited opportunities so it makes us competitive and it creates an environment where you want to get out do something and hopefully achieve great things so growing up i was in second year of dental school when my uncle he's dean of i think ajman university in ua god bless him amazing advice so what he told me was i was in second year and he said mo we will meet again he, he would come every year to this day he visits my family uh, every year amazing amazing relationship he said mo we will meet again after two years when we will talk about this particular thing that i'm going to say to you today 
over the next two years, I want you to develop a hobby. Any free time you have, you will sit on the internet. You will find all the different schools in all the different countries across different continents offering dental programs. I want you to make a register. Now, remember, back in the day, we were talking about 2006 and 7, the information was scarce. Not everything was on the internet. The internet speed was very slow. And we're talking about Pakistan, right? So gathering all that information was difficult back then. So he said, I want you to make a register. You will write down country name, university name, program name, application deadline, everything. And I want you to make a full register. Gather all the information. When I meet you after two years, I don't want you to be able to open the book and read that stuff. No. After two years, if I say, Turkey, you should be saying Murmara University, Yadi Tepe University, uh, ortho program is three years. For example, Yadi Tepe University, $20,000 US uh, for one year. It used to be that. I want all the information. It should be on your fingertips. And I said, okay, I'll do it. And he was telling me, he met me recently and he says, Mo, I give your example to my students now. Because he says, I, I tell them, after two years, my nephew pretty much knew about all the programs across like, you know, uh, different continents and major universities. So that is one thing you need to prepare the extra time that you get spend towards gathering information. Information is key and you can use it in any field. Like, you know, what do you want to do? So I, at one stage, there was a chance I might end up going to China. I started learning Mandarin. I don't remember it because that was back in 2011. I never used it. I never went there, but I thought, okay, if there is an opportunity, I'll try my best. I started learning Mandarin. And I could make small talk. Like to this day, I was in the bank and like, you know, the manager was Mandarin. And I said, ni hao, ni hao, ma, han hao. Like I can speak a little bit. Similarly, when I was at McGill, uh, I came in doing a non-thesis MSc. My goal was I want to be good enough. I had zero knowledge, zero knowledge about research or anything. My goal was I want to be good enough so that I'm offered a PhD position. By the end of first semester, God bless my supervisor. And she's, I cannot thank her enough, Dr. Marie Cartanen. She said, Mo, I have a PhD position for you. So, and what did I do? I had to uh, wean, keep mice, do their DNA something and all. No idea. You know, like, you know, you have gone through the BDS, right? No clue how I'm going to do it. And I had a lot more courses than people who were doing thesis based. So the only time, I, sometimes I went to lab to do my work at two at night or three at night. And I finished my machine about one year and five months, I think. I did my coursework, completed everything. It was a two years program. And during that time, I went to, for example, like, you know, I wanted to take some time off if I could in between. Sometimes I went to swimming pool to swim, to get some exercise in at three at night because I didn't have time in the day. And when I finished my program, my time spent at McGill, somebody was asking me the other day about French. Did you learn French? I said, no, because I wanted to, yes, I should have, but I spent my time so that, you know, by the, by the time I finished McGill, I had, I, I ended up getting, I think, six, seven publications out of that time, from that time, which was amazing. So coming to your point, if you want to succeed, not just perio, make sure you keep all the options open. Try. I'm saying this specifically for Pakistan. People in North America may not understand, but in context of Pakistan, like, you know, try your best, use your time and try to make the most of it. So that is a, that's a general advice. Now, coming to Perio, you said about scope. I cannot be enough thankful. I am so grateful for the opportunity. I'm grateful to Canada, Canadians, uh, everybody here. Just cannot thank enough. It's a land of opportunity. People say that about US. I can say it about Canada. Perio is a great field, great field, amazing field. 
The only problem is, just like any other field, it's super competitive. It is insanely competitive, not just radio. All the, I'll give you an example. So in US, there are 60, 70 dental schools. Okay, Each school, let's say, to make math very simple, let's say each school takes, there are, let's pretend there are 70 schools and there are, each school takes three residents, let's just say. So in a round figure, we're looking at 210 residents being accepted per year in a round figure, let's say. In Canada, I program two to three residents. Yes, the population is less, I understand. But what people don't realize, is people from all different nations are immigrating to Canada. People with amazing credentials are coming to Canada. So there was a guy, I'll give an example. There was a guy, he was a professor, principal of a, a very famous college in a country. A specialist had done his master's from uh, a European country, a PhD from, a, from North America. He applied, he was not accepted. Okay, so it's so competitive. In order to have a good chance, what you need to do is work on your resume, your skill, how you can improve, how you can improve, be better, not just in perio, uh, but in, in any field. And even if you've like, you know, you've been blessed that you've achieved something, improve, excel. So it's amazing, but it's very competitive. Right, sir. So again, one uh, question that comes to our mind is the difference between experience and training. How would you answer that question? So, like, you know, reminds me of another thing. I apologize. When you apply for a job, what do they say? You need to have two years experience or five years experience, right? Well, I'm a fresh graduate, then will not give you a job. Well, if you don't give me the job, I will not get the experience, right? So where do I go? So training is in context. Let's put it in context of perio, okay, or dentistry. So I'll use my example. Uh, let's say it was my residency time, right? I go in there. I am being trained. My instructors are there. God bless them. They're teaching me do this, 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 whatever. We go through the mail. You learn the true uh, training then over time a time comes hopefully when you can look at a thing and you can say you know what in this case i'll do this i'll use this technique i will do this 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 or this and somebody may ask why or how can you say it like okay i understand you're going to do a connective tissue graph but why would you do a tunnel here versus a Kelly technique or this? And you say, I just know it. I just know it. Like, you know, this will work here. And then, okay, yes, you can defend it. You can explain. But even before you explain or defend, when you say you know it or in your heart, the, this is how you know it, that's experience. And no substitute for experience. Training is a must. Training leads you to be in a position where hopefully you improve and you gain experience. It's not like, you know, either or. You need to have both. But experience, I, I am privileged. I cannot be enough thankful. The practice where I work, we have a periodontist, Don, amazing, amazing guy. He's been doing perio for the last, I think, approximately in around figure 40 years. Another periodontist who has two uh, brothers who are plastic surgeons in Hollywood. And those two brothers say that our sister is a much better surgeon. And another periodontist who is one of the very best in the world, in my experience, she's only worked for the last 10, 12 years. But in my experience, I've seen her work. I've seen a lot of people's work. And I've seen the volume of work as well. This colleague of mine, in my experience, she's worked more than people typically do in 25 years. So it's nice, like, you know, when you sit among such a company and they discuss cases, like, you know, especially when I came, I felt intimidated initially. Like, I had, I had already had, I think, uh, about 1.5 years of private practice experience when I came in this practice. 
And I was like, wow. And when they tell me, like, you know, when we're talking the other day, my colleague was asking me, Mo, how would you place the implant there? And I felt like, no, 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 you're too good. Like, I'm nobody compared to you. I'm just nobody. But it gave me immense satisfaction that she considered me worthy enough that she asked me, like, she's the best. I'm just like, you know, an average Joe. So that experience is, is, there is no substitute, but it comes with time. But you need to have the training to be able to execute and that repeated execution over time will give you experience. When I had my first leader, I remember I was telling this to my colleague yesterday. I said, you know, I was in private practice when I had a major bleeder in the greater palatine artery it was like, psst, 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 psst. I, during training, I didn't have it, but I saw it. Somebody else's case, I did see, but it was a real life situation. My first experience didn't panic, managed, took me about half an hour of suturing, but it was completely fine. The patient was good. But that experience now is invaluable. It's just amazing. Yesterday, when my colleague was saying that, you know, there's a little bit of bleeding, I said, dude, relax. We'll take care of it. Don't worry. Right? So experience is just priceless, but training leads to that experience over time. Right, sir. Thank you for that. So, sir, another question, uh, which I, uh, you know, had the, uh, you, uh, you can say, I, I thought about all these questions and this question came to my mind that the new technologies in perio and implants. So we've seen that perio is going way beyond from, uh, you know, your soft tissue surgeries, like they, they would do connective tissue grafts and now they're doing like something else. Like the work has improved dynamically. So what are the new techniques which are coming in perio and implants as well? There are a lot of new things which are being like, I think one another important, any industry, think about it this way, oral and maxillofacial surgery. Why, why everybody talks about perio now? Prosto as well a little bit, but perio is at the forefront, I believe. Two reasons. One, a lot of people, I, excuse me, one reason I don't think a lot of people know. The second is obvious. What is the first reason? Interestingly, most research, even for oral maxillofacial surgery, is done in perio. Most number of publications, it used to be about 100,000 articles per year, give and take. I don't know now, but that's when I, what I knew back in the residency are published in good quality journals, roughly uh, around the globe. And bone research, basic science research, healing, all that is done or falls under the domain of perio. So perio is essential in that regard. And perio is connected to other body as well, like health systems. So that makes sense. But from marketing, from uh, financial side of things, all the companies, if they have something which they can make and sell, they would promote it as well. So Perio has the tools. When it comes to oral surgery, I'll give you an example. Most oral surgeons here, what do they do? They do wisdom teeth extraction, privy sedation. What do you need for wisdom teeth extraction? A forcep elevators, burst, handpiece. It's not fancy. Like, you know, you'll sell it once, it will last a long time. So from a company's perspective, probably not too beneficial to promote that. Right from perio, you have different implants, different designs, different surfaces, healing abutments, then cover screws, then different drills. Like there is, there are so many things that you can sell. That is why you see a lot of marketing there, right? So that's why perio is at the forefront. Having said that, I am a firm, and there are, I understand a lot of things are being thrown. So much, it's it's rapid. The the evolving perio thing it's rapid it's huge i understand but i am a firm believer in the fundamentals as well you need to have a very solid base on top of that you can build stuff now there are many things i know like you know uh, for people who may not know so i'll put it simply we have guided surgery has been there for quite some time another one is a nav system where basically you're placing the implant you're looking at the screen while you're placing the implant it shows you live 
CDCT based implant placement. Same in the grafts, like, you know, same in the bone grafts, same in soft tissue grafting. This is all cool. This is all amazing. But you need to have very good fundamentals. I'll give you an example. I was placing an implant and I was using a surgical guide, fully guided everything. I did my initial drill and I took a radiograph, looked good, but clinically the emergence did not look that good. I was amazed. Like I checked my guide. I wanted to make sure that it, it was snug fitting. There was no flaw. But we know there are errors in CDCT. There are errors in, and we had taken a scan impression, intraoral scanning, but there are errors and those errors are amplified when you're making a, making a guide. So I removed the guide and I placed the implant manually and I was joking that day. I told my staff, I said, I'm so happy, so grateful that I placed many implants with my hands in my training. Because if that wasn't the case, if I was completely technology dependent, I would like, okay, what I do? Stop the procedure, call the patient in. So despite all these things, the fundamentals have to be there. You should be able to do all the basic necessary. Yesterday, I saw a case where uh, regenerative surgery had been done five years ago. And in my opinion, I could be wrong. That case was not appropriate for regenerative. So I told the patient that, you know, we'll probably end up doing the traditional perioresective approach. It was a posterior lower left. So you need to have all the tools and then the new technology should facilitate, should improve, but it should be time tested and it should also be like, you know, basic science level. It should be very thorough, meticulously tested. And then if it comes in, yes. On a side note, uh, which, which is connected to the thing we discussed, it depends on where you practice as well. On a side note, for example, in my training as well, like, you know, you could do the, the block graft, the harvest and all those things. And in Pakistan, when it comes to bone grafting, a lot of times we just do it that way. But given we are, I am in North America, a lot of patients don't accept it. They don't want it. So that's where the technology helps. And you're like, okay, I'll use some substitutes, a membrane. I'll pack some bone from outside. I'll not harvest your bone. So the technology is amazing. A lot of new things are coming in, but before hopping or jumping onto them straight away, fundamentals, basic, necessary, and any technology should be very thoroughly tested. And after that, if you, you practice, practice, improve, and when you're comfortable, only then you should go live. All right, sir. Now we'll take in some myth busters. So uh, the first question is, does scaling make our teeth weak okay no 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 it's important and it's so funny because a lot of my colleagues my really good dear friends from pakistan they just send sometimes they give me a call no you know my dentist he is asking me to have scaling done twice a year or something i'm like dude it's important please do it no it's important it's really important please have your teeth clean Right, sir. So another question related to scaling. Does scaling make our teeth sensitive? It may. It may sometimes. Depends case to case. But just like perio surgery. So when I do perio surgery, flap procedure, for example, I'll tell the patient there is a lot like there's a possibility that there will be some transient temporary sensitivity. Don't be alarmed. Over time it will go away. And if you can use a certain toothpaste, let's say which has strontium or potassium salt, you'll be fine. Don't worry about it. But when you give somebody an injection, let's say for, does, it, does an injection cause discomfort? Yes. Then why do you take it? Well, it's essential. Same thing is true for, for scaling. Another example is, let's say you wake up in the morning and you rub your eye. God forbid if blood was coming through your eye, would you be comfortable? You'd be like, oh my God, what's happening? No. So when blood is coming through your gums, why should you be comfortable? You shouldn't be comfortable. Just saying. Right. Uh, so, sir, another question. Uh, again, you talked about toothpaste. So, what do you think is the perfect uh, toothpaste for sensitive teeth? <laughs> I don't know. Like, you know, you're putting me. Another interesting thing. I'll, like, you know, I'll, I'll answer it slightly differently. I've had this question asked. So, when I talk about hygiene to my patients, they say sometimes, I hope Oral B doesn't listen to this. Okay. 
<laughs> so they asked me about the toothpaste and brush and whatnot. And I, like, you know, after the surgery, when I see them after two, three weeks, whatever, I say use a soft brush and I'll go over the brushing technique. And then they would say, Mo, I have, a, I have an electric toothbrush. And then I say, okay, there are two different types of electric toothbrush, chiefly. There are other as well, but two main big companies, uh, one of which is Sonic Care. And I say, I wish I had shares in Sonic Care. I don't have any shares in Sonic Care. I don't have any trust. But I say the mechanism of action of Sonic Care is different than compared to Apple B. So same thing, like, you know, if you, uh, basic thing is if it's a good toothpaste, has fluoride, has strontium, potassium, and all those things, it, it's okay. Like, the problem is people don't brush teeth. It's not the, the toothpaste is not the problem. So please brush teeth. That's the bottom line. All right. Uh, so, sir, uh, again, there is this uh, fallacy or this question or a myth that uh, teeth cleaning and teeth whitening are the same thing. So what's your take on that? Okay. Okay. So teeth whitening, if you want to do it, if you're a YouTuber, if you're somebody like, you know, Okay, I am sorry, but it reminds me of another question. When I was practicing elsewhere in another city, a lot of times, like, you know, patients would come to see and come to see me and they would say, I want that Hollywood smile. And I'm thinking, okay, your perio is like, you know, bone wise, things are really bad. We need to stabilize that first and then go from there. So teeth whitening, aesthetics, all that I understand. But at the end of the day, it's the cleaning is more important, especially in the, in the context of a bigger picture. Um, God forbid, I've seen a lot of cases where men and women in their 40s lose all the teeth. I've seen a lot of those cases, unfortunately. Or in their 50s where all the teeth are wiggly, like, you know, they can blow with air and they end up having dentures. So not that teeth cleaning will prevent that in every single case, but that will reduce the rate of bone loss per down to loss, even in the worst of cases. So teeth cleaning it is. Right, sir. So another question which is readily asked, uh, so is that, is implant, is the dental implant procedure a painful procedure or not? Again, like, you know, every case is different. And why do I say that? <clears throat> I've had cases, I've had the experience where sometimes you're amazed, like there shouldn't be any pain, but there is pain. But generally, if I was to give a general statement, at least in my experience, in my hands, I tell my patients and my colleagues and the staff who works for me can attest to it. When I like, if I joke a lot during the procedure to reduce the anxiety. So I tell the patients, I say, if I've extracted your tooth, if you've had the extraction, I would typically ask them, like, you know, let's say you've come to me, you had a tooth extracted elsewhere. What was your experience on a scale of one to 10? Where would you put the pain? They may say five, they may say six, they may say seven. I would say generally the implant would be way much easier, nicer, smooth, not a problem. It should be a walk in the park. Very simple, very easy. Pain-wise, don't worry about it. The worst part of the procedure, my typical thing is I tell them the worst part of, of the procedure is the anesthetic. If you've had dental freezing before, then you're a pro chill and relax. Enjoy the ride. You'll be fine. Very simple. In most cases, pain shouldn't be an issue. <clears throat> All right, sir. Another question related to implants. Do implants fail very often? Now, there are two... There are two... How do you define a failure? It's a little academic. To put it simply, one thing is survival. What is survival? I'll, I'll try to make it very simple. Survival means you've put the implant in the bone, you let it sit, and after four or five months, you come in and you test if this implant has become integrated with the bone. When you test, in terms of integrity, in terms of implant being bonded to the bone solidly, it's about 97 to 98%, typically. Now, the other is success. What is success? Success can be defined differently. Success means if you've placed the implant, you hope, wish, and pray that, that implant stays for a long period of time complications-free or with very minimal complications. So a very nice paper was Elbergson 1986 or 80, I'm forgetting the year. 
where they came up with a certain criteria. Like, you know, it has to be this, 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 this. Stringent criteria, stringent criteria. Based on that criteria, after 10 years, 80% implants were still considered successful, which is very good. But that doesn't mean the 20% failed to integrate. They were still in the mouth. They were still functional, majority of them, but they were not the gold standard level implants. Like, you know, in terms of marks, you may give them 80, you may give them 70, but they are functional and the patient may or may not have issue with them. So in a nutshell, if somebody asks me, are implants successful? If I wanted to give an answer to a lay person, I would say implants are the best substitute for a natural tooth. But in my opinion, natural teeth are still the way to go. Right, sir. So the final question about uh, on this MythBuster session is that uh, is bone grafting compulsory for implant? So previously, like you know, in 200 BC, let's say the implants were placed where the bone was. So let's say, let's say, like you know, you want to place an implant and you open up the area and you're like, okay, where is the bone? This is the bone. This is where I'll drill. I'll put the implant. The prosthodontist or the restoring dentist, come on, dude, this is your job. You just restore it. Do it anyway. Things have changed now. Now we look at it's prosthetically driven, which simply means the patient comes to you. You look at the area. You listen to what the patient wants. Then you explain that, you know, okay, the patient wants a perfect tooth, a perfect smile and everything. You look at the area and you say, you know what? Okay, I'll try to put the put the final crown, the final tooth, because for patient crown doesn't make sense, tooth is what they want. So we tell them, okay, this is where we would want to put the final crown. If my final crown is here, I cannot put my implant here. It has to somehow come here. If, I've talk, if I'm talking about an upper, let's say, right? One, one, two, one. This is my final crown coming out like this. My implant has to follow. How do I make it happen? I can use an angle screw, I can use a bone graft. So in those cases where there is not enough bone to prosthetically or place the crown in the ideal position, we need to put the implant in optimal position and for that bone grafting does become essential. Right, but sir. but right, one sir. more thing, if I, if yes, I may add, yes, please. In today's world with the substitutes that we have, like, you know, with IV sedation and everything, we can reduce the anxiety. Patient is like, you know, not fully at a conscious level, moderately sedated, whatever. But also, prior to that, some people, a lot of people, they're not comfortable having bone taken out from their jaw. So to them, we can say, you know, we have substitutes with which we can build, hopefully, good enough bone that we can place the implant in an optimal position or prosthetically drill. All right, sir. Thank you so much for your time. And My pleasure. I'm grateful. For, for the final, uh, for uh, your final thoughts, and uh, any message would you you would like to give to our dental students, our dental professionals over there in Pakistan? Keep learning, keep improving, and put in the hours, put in the work. There are no shortcuts. Takes time, but like you know, if you keep doing good work, and one thing I would suggest to you is. At the end of the day, when you're done, if you're a professional doing dentistry, at the end of the day, once you're done with your work, sit back, look at the case, and think about it, how you could have improved. And if you're a student, explore all the avenues. If you're in Pakistan, again, I'm saying this again and again, because a lot of people will not understand in North America, look at all the options. It's very comparative. It's not easy. So in your extra time, in your spare time, look at, okay, where else can I apply? What are the different options? If I do this particular program, can I give? Because in Pakistan, we typically go with fellowships from England. Is this program approved there? And how is the quality of the training? What specialty, like, you know, what certificate will I get? How much experience? How many clinical hours I will get there? So all those things, like, you know, make the most of your time while you're a student. And your hobby should also be such that it, aids it helps in your professional development so as long as you do that hope wish and pray you'll be fine all right sir thank you so much for your time and i thank hope you. that all the people who uh, who are listening to us will gather all these pearls of information pearls of wisdom from you 
and i hope inshallah they'll do better in their fields of life that's what i hope for that's what i thank you so much for your time sir and i hope you stay well thank you sir super grateful have a good one thank you sir take care